Well, good damn afternoon, Americans. Jericho Green here with you once again. And like your portfolio, I like to diversify my content. I don't always talk about the social political aspects of our lives, but I also like to get a little financial with it. I like to talk about those precious metals and who better to talk to about that than the CEO and founder of Noble Gold Investments, the man, the myth, the legend, the father, the husband, the proud American, Colin Blue. How, How are you? you? How are you doing? Great. Doing good. This post Easter Monday, we were talking off cam about uh, the days that we had yesterday and we made it, man. We made it. Another major holiday in the books. Yeah. I was talking to somebody about like what a CEO does. And I, I really just think you're just a high level project manager. If you really just think about what you're doing, you're just got this project and you got this project and you got this project and you're just making sure that they get to the finish line as the silver's rolling off the table. We don't want to have that. I mean, that's really what, you know, a CEO does is just making sure that, that the ship's running and that the projects get, you know, completed on time. And, and, uh, but I, but I do, I do love it. I, I love what we do. And, and uh, yeah, it's all, always fun to have some, you know, silver out here on the table and Man. you know, people have been calling me saying gold's going through the moon. What's going on with silver? And it, it, it's a, it's a conundrum that uh, has been around for a long time, but I think it, it's even more confusing today uh, than it's been in the past because we're looking at almost 88 to one gold to silver ratio uh, or silver to gold ratio, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, but yeah, silver is quite, you know, the talking point right now. And, and uh, we've had a number of our investors and, and, you know, this isn't financial advice, but we've had a lot of financial, we've had a lot of investors sell some of their gold and, and slide into silver. Uh, which is one of the great things about doing an IRA with us is that that's a tax deferred um, move. So you basically, you know, some of my clients have, have profited substantially in gold and they, they like where silver's sitting. So they take a little gold, they take, they swap it out for, for, you know, silver and we do all that for them. Uh, so that's been quite interesting um, to see that move happening. They don't want to go back in the dollar, you know, they, they don't want to sit in cash. Mm -hmm. They want us to get into something that can outperform this incredible uh, inflation. So yeah, silver sitting in the mid twenties, gold's you know pretty close to twenty three hundred dollars an ounce, sitting in the you know twenty two hundred dollar range. Um, so silver's been the talk of the town in precious metals uh, lately. So from what I've been reading, it sounds like there's going to be not a new player, but that the player is going to get bigger. So you have the industrial applications of silver and automotive, uh, automotives, computers, uh, solar panels and things of that nature. But now you have these green initiatives. So is that going to put a little more of a strain on the silver supply? Yeah. And it's going to this what we're talking about now is going to parlay into the next thing we're talking about, which is you know, environmentally what what people are investing into and, and whether that should be how that should be dictated to consumers. But um, yeah, it, it's a big part of what we're seeing is that, you know, the world is moving towards uh, EV vehicles, they're moving towards reducing uh, carbon emissions. And, it, it, you know, there are these massive organizations that are focused on it. So everything where we're going, uh, whether you like it or not, is going towards more of this green initiative and silver plays a big part of that. Um, so I think it's important to, to realize that it is an industrial metal that's in high demand. Um, and like I was saying six months ago with gold, it's like everything has gone up inflation wise, food costs, um, you know, everything we're using day to day, yet gold hadn't moved. And now I'm sort of saying the same thing about silver. Silver surprisingly has a move and people are always saying, why isn't it back above its all time high? I mean, why isn't it at 50 or 55 or 60? And I think all those numbers are very realistic uh, for a number of reasons. One, the market of silver market is quite small. Um, Bitcoin has actually surpassed the silver market um, and just in terms of total market share out there. 
Um, so it's a small market and a small market in demand can move very quickly. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of excitement um, about this metal and, and people are talking about it. And I think the uses are just gonna, gonna continue to grow over time. So the whole, all of the green initiatives and everything, is that sustainable? Or are we gonna see this kind of come back down to earth, you know, the next 20 years or so? Because, you know, they do, they are pushing EV, you know, electric vehicles and, and you have laws here in California that are outlawing a lot of, you know, in the coming, what, next 10 years or so, outlawing a lot of gas powered vehicles, even blowers, you know, the for the gardeners and stuff out there. Yeah. So being that that's the case and there will always be, you know, I think gas powered things, but going electric can be, especially with a car, can be a little expensive. It is more expensive Absolutely. than a gas powered vehicle. So in that sense, do you think it's sustainable? Or are we going to pretty much see this is pretty much going to be par for the course for the rest? Of our I mean, I, I, it's it's a rhetorical question. And I always ask people, like, where do you think gas prices are going to go? Do you think there's more of a likelihood that we could be paying eight to ten dollars or twelve dollars? Or do you think we're going back to two dollars? And I think most people would say mm. it's better. It's more there's more of a chance of going eight to ten. So even though I do think electric vehicles are more expensive, if you do think if you bought a car today and it is more expensive, 10, 20,000, if you think that gas is, has a better chance to go to eight to 12, you're probably going to do better in, in that time period with, with a, a electric vehicle. Um, it's not going to be better. I mean, the joke of it is, is that the lithium and everything in the battery is probably not going to be better for the environment. So that's mm -hmm. sort of let's dispel those <laughs> myths. But yeah, I mean, listen, if you can you can charge up and, and you got solar and you can charge up at your house and you never have to pay for for a gallon of gas again, uh, I think over time you're going to end up winning if gas prices go to eight to 12. I think you're going to do that's And listen, I don't know what's going to happen, but I think if, if that's where we go, um, I think you're going to be better off. And, and ultimately, like it comes down to what the world is, is doing. And, you know, if you have all these major governments uh, pushing us in this direction and they're going to go away from gas vehicles, um, I, I think the price of electric vehicles will continue to come down. Uh, I think it, it will we'll get into a better range that's more affordable. We are seeing some of it already. I mean, not that Tesla is very affordable, but we've seen them drop their prices pretty significantly. Um, and, and I think that it's going to continue to go in that direction. And I think some really smart, uh, manufacturer is going to come out with a $20,000 car that can fit a family of five, uh, that's EV. And once that sort of Pandora's box is open, I think, uh, the market will be much better. So that's, I mean, that's just one use of it, um, that we're continuing to see, but most places, a lot of the buses are going EV. A lot of the the trucks that uh, different states are using are going uh, electric. So I, I think it's just a, a cost thing that it's just eventually we got to get that cost to a point that that makes it affordable here. Um, and and it and it, a lot of it is just like we're talking about investing. It is you are sort of taking a calculated guess about where the future is going to be. But I think when I tell people like if gas prices go to eight to twelve, where do you, where do you think how, how much money do you think you'll save daily or monthly on not having to put gas in the car? And that's basically double the cost today. Mm -hmm. um, I think people realize that that's probably where things are going to go. Well, if the person who's working on a cheap electric vehicle for a family of five, make sure you don't come out with that technology too early. You know what I mean? It could be hazardous to your health. <laughs> um, but um, so with the, like you mentioned, government uh, entities going green, so that means they're going to need a little more silver. So to somebody who's who's looking to invest and they're saying, okay, gold is a little rich for my blood, silver is more my speed. And with the silver, um, hold on a second, with the silver institute, I was going to say index, with the silver institute predicting that we're looking at a 15% increase in silver consumption in 2024, um, is this something that they should maybe kind of sit back and see where it goes? Because that's a big increase in one year. Or is this something they need to, to strike while the iron's hot? Well, I mean, I think what it comes down to in the short, you know, I'm not a short term investor on anything. You know, I'm an entrepreneur, so I invest in businesses. You, you're not going to make a quick return in a business. It takes time. Um, 
you know, my cryptocurrency trading platform uh, is hitting our three year mark. Uh, actually, it hit. I'm sorry, it hit three years this this uh, in March and we're finally in profit. But it took three years. So I never I don't look at investing like in two months or six months. I look at buying stuff that I think is going to be very profitable in the future. So I think that, um, you know, looking at a long term investor, I, I look at two things. I want something that has liquidity and has big time returns long term. And and so I think silver long term has both both of those. Um, mm -hmm. It has it is liquid because anyone will buy this and it, it, you can sell it in a, in, a, in a second. And I think long term, I think fifty dollars an ounce silver price, you know, in the next three or four years is very realistic. Um, and then you look at interest rates, you know, if they everyone doesn't know what's going to happen with the Fed, but they've said, you know, two to three times they are going to lower rates. I mean, anytime you expand the money supply, in theory, things that have a limited supply should become more valuable. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's also a good sign, probably short term. Um, but I, I never typically look at anything uh, sort of short term. I think you want to look at minimum three to five years on any kind of thing that you're uh, investing into. I think the only thing that makes sense, you know, that people have been doing is, you know, they've been putting cash in the bank and making four or five percent. But I think that's going to end because once they start dropping rates, you're looking at rates probably getting in the you know two percent, two and a half percent range uh, with banks, which I don't think is exciting enough for anybody to to really keep it a, a lot of money there. It doesn't make a lot of sense financially because you're looking at inflation, you know, seven to ten percent. So if you're making two percent a bank, which is where things are going to go, um, I don't think it's enough to to make a return that you're happy with. Okay, so be patient is what you're saying. Yeah, be patient and 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 but also look at what's happening out there um, and and make sure that you're informed. Um, but yeah, I mean, the IRA is is great for for these types of things, because, you know, let's say silver does do, do that run and then you wanted to go back in the stock market at some point because the stock market was more affordable. You could do that with a silver IRA with us. You could sell the silver and then go back into stocks and not pay any tax. That's that's the beauty behind the IRA uh, vehicles. Everything is is taxed at first. You can keep all those gains, those massive gains, and then slide into another investment. If anyone wants to get more information about how that works, um, we can obviously help them out with that. They can learn about, you know, what our gold and silver IRA looks like and how it's, you know, tax deferred. OK, so something I wanted to talk about in the segue you mentioned earlier is ESG. And when you hear what that acronym stands for, it might make your toes curl a little bit, it might make a bit a drop of anger blood come out of your nostril because it stands for environmental, social and governance. So this sounds to me, it sounds a bit intrusive you know, with the government regulations and stuff like that. And that's the the regulations they come up with. It's almost like they're the dreamer and we're the realists. Mm -hmm. They have all these bright ideas and these things they want to do, but that's sometimes that's different from the actual real world application of it. So right. if you could please explain what the ESG means, what it does and how it affects, you know, our, our, uh, our investing. You know, because it's it's going to affect the affect the companies that we invest with. Yeah. So, it, in essence, it takes a an approach of um, taking the idea of business and putting some criteria there that is a criteria that was created by you know a certain sector of people. <laughs> In mm -hmm. essence, um, the first time I, I heard about ESG and ESG investing was I was talking to a, a person at a party that was a trust fund uh, baby, and they were talking to me about ESG investing and, and what this was maybe like 15 years ago and what what that meant. And, you know, that that's what they and their family do is they they focus on these initiatives. And of course, when you're a trust fund baby, it's really nice to have the the latitude uh, of being able to just have a sort of 
elevated view of the world. Um, but for people that run businesses, the people that want profit, the people that um, that are actually doing the work to in companies, um, it's a slippery slope, I would say, you know, this type of because how they determine what qualifies and what doesn't qualify can be uh, subjective. And so you're looking at, you know, I'll just throw in an example of what he had mentioned to me would be like tobacco companies. Mm -hmm. Tobacco companies would not fall under uh, ESG because, you know, the, the, the social impact on humans is would be negative so they don't invest into those things um but then like what's the next step <clears throat> what about casinos i mean a lot of casinos are highly profitable um a lot of people like you know to have fun and go gambling it would it would also in my opinion probably not fall under the category what about silver mining uh what's the environmental impact of silver mining what's the environmental impact of uh, look, you know, mining for looking for oil. What's the, you know, I, I, you could just go on and on and on and on. And so I, I do think it's difficult to, uh, to create criteria for companies that maybe do industries that are a little unsavory to, to some people, but also necessary to others. Uh, a lot of states are living off casino money right now, better mm -hmm. or worse. I mean, every state, Texas, I mean, you name it, they're all opening casinos because they need revenue. Um, so it, it's it's one of those things where if you're uh, uh, in a situation where you can make your own determinations in terms of investing and you don't feel it, something is is an industry that you want to invest into, then you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't you shouldn't buy, you know, you shouldn't buy tobacco stocks. But uh, also, there are people, tobacco stocks are still available. People still are smoking cigarettes. And so it's just part of the world that we live in. And so you, everyone votes either with their pocketbook or they, you know, they vote, you know, uh, for their elected uh, officials. And so I, I do think there can be very onerous. And, and I think, you, you know, you, you mentioned it's, it's frustrating to see some of these types of uh, initiatives out there because they, I mean, listen, they can determine that what we're talking about right now doesn't fall within some of those categories, right? right. Because maybe it's something that they don't agree with. Um, because if you really dive into ESG, there's there's a lot of, you know, broad implications there. So it's it's uh, it's it's for a very unique sector of the world that's able to make these determinations and, and impose their moral beliefs on everybody else, in my opinion. Yeah, because who's determining what's what? Who's determining what environmental impact is bad enough to fall under their umbrella? Or, right. you know, are these regulations made at some, you know, fancy dinner party somewhere with a bunch of people wearing those weird, you know, uh, what do they call them, steampunk masks and stuff like that? <laughs> like, what? Um, and speaking of casinos, I would think as a layman that other than the actual building of the casino, what are the environmental impacts on that? How could that even fall under ESG? I mean, unless like it could be physically detrimental to you, like if you owe somebody a bunch of money right. and they hurt right. you. But other than like the building and the, you know, digging and all that kind of stuff that goes into the construction. I don't, I don't yeah. I, I mean, I'll give you an example. I own a REIT stock uh, called O. I've owned this stock for, I think, like 20 years. And they recently bought the land where the Wynn or the Venetian and the Wynn, two or three casinos, they bought it and they did a lease. And basically the casino is going to lease back the land for them for like 20, 30 years. I was ecstatic when they did this deal. I mean, I was like, this is so smart that they're going to own the ground. They basically did a ground lease. They own the ground and below a casino, which obviously is never going to stop paying. Uh, it was a sweet deal. That the the ESG might have a problem with that deal, if you know, depending on the fund. You know, there's all these funds. There's funds that are closing left, right, and center, though. Because I will tell you, a lot of the big institutions they thought this would be like something great that people would want to invest into, but they can't make a profit. So a lot of these funds, you look at, you know, Ray Dalio talks about it, and he's like, you know, these 
we have to create regulations that help us through this difficult time. And we need to focus on profit. And, and that's what, what business should be doing is focusing on profit. And, and, and ultimately, um, you know, if there is something that's absolutely affecting, uh, you know, how we live, then the government will come in and, and try to fix those things. But to have these ESG regulations, these ESG investments, um, it, it, it really just doesn't make a whole lot of sense in, in this kind of environment. Yeah, because climate change, uh, and I hate to even use that term, but it seems so uncontrollable because, yes, you know, throwing garbage out, toxic waste and, and the things we do to the environment, is it detrimental? Yes. Is it not good? Yes. But do we have the impact on the environment? I think that's ultimately the question, especially when you come to things like ESG. Do we ultimately have the impact on the planet that we think we have? Have we even been here long enough to keep records to show yeah, we're really affecting this. Because when I was growing up, it was all about the hole in the ozone layer. If right. You, you ladies use an Aquanet, you're contributing to the hole. You're burning a hole in our protection in the atmosphere. And that argument has seemed to have gone away. So did the ozone layer repair itself? And if it did, turns out we weren't as impactful as we thought we were because it just closed right. up right. somehow. Um, so that's what I mean when, when you have the people who are making these rules and regulations it sounds like they're just, you know, for lack of a better term, just kind of pulling them out of their ass. Because, yeah, who determines that? Are we? We don't have the. We haven't been on this earth long enough to say we really do have an impact. Yeah, I mean, you could go so much so far with this too. You could say like the Gap, the clothing company, has had because they're so they made so much clothes, and you know, I don't know if you look. They've talked about it. there's so much extra clothes out there in the world, and they think there's it's having a dramatic. Are they gonna? Are they gonna include? the gap in that because they did their job and they sold a whole lot of clothes. I mean, at the end of the day, like that's, that was their job. They, mm -hmm. they created that business to, to sell a lot of clothes and they, they sold a lot of clothes. And so now we realize that there's probably too much clothes out there. So what are we going to do? We're going to go back and, and put some regulations on gap about how much clothes they can sell because ultimately how would they make money? You know? Mm -hmm. And so for me, Jericho, someone that looks at, you know, business in general, I think, you know, obviously regulation is, is difficult. We do know that there's there needs to be some, but this ESG impact and, and the way that it's focused, it, it doesn't seem it's it's for the, the, the greater good. It's to impose a certain uh, amount of restrictions in areas that that group or those governing bodies feels um, is, is negative either socially or environmentally to, to the world. And I, and I think, you know, having these watchdog groups, uh, does make it more and more difficult to, uh, to continue to do business. And, and we do need, uh, more of a free flowing economy because I think the big lie Jericho right now is that, you know, unemployment's low and that everything is going great. Yet everyone I talk to that's in a lot of service industries, they're not doing well, you know? And so if our economy was doing really great, people in service industries would typically do well too. People that worked at hotels, people that work at restaurants, you know, these things have not bounced back the way a lot of people thought that they would. Um, you know, people are working in those industries, but they're definitely not working in a point where they feel like there's, there's, they're, they're growing themselves. Their, their, their pocketbooks are growing. So I think the idea of, of creating more restrictions right now uh, in this in this U.S. economy doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And I think that that's the big lie with these, you know, low unemployment numbers and the stock market high is that everything's getting better. Uh, but, you know, the only thing that's really getting better for is the one percent. The one percent hit. I, I, I read the other day, 44 trillion in in wealth, the top one percent. And mm. so, you know, the 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 things that have happened under this administration, I think, are furthering for the, the very, very wealthy, um, but for, for, you know, regular people, we're not seeing the kind of initiatives and, and regular people become wealthy people through business and through, through creating wealth through business or creating wealth through smart investing, through, you know, finding opportunities, which is kind of what we're talking about today with silver mm -hmm. is that you have to be able to find opportunities with that nest egg that you have. 
Um, otherwise, you know, you can't create wealth uh, in, in this kind of economy. So basically, invest in precious metals, people. Noblegoldinvestments.com. Yeah, and, and 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 call us. You know, call us and and talk to us and learn learn what we do and get information. I know you. A lot of people probably seen the show a million times and thought about it, but it, you know, I think the most important thing is call us, give us your email, let us start emailing you information. Um, you know, my silver book is coming out in about three or four weeks, so that'll be exciting. Uh, we have a master class that's coming out. This is actually the first time I've announced it. We have a master class coming out with Kevin Sorbo, who played Hercules. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's going to be coming out. That should be live. By the next time we interview in like three, four weeks, um, he did a 10-part uh, economic toolkit master class on video. That's incredible. Uh, such good information. So call us, get your information in the system. So as we release these things, we can send it out to you and, you know, definitely feel free to uh, just call. And if you like to talk to a live person and get your questions answered, um, you know, there's the number 877-646-5347. Um, well, and, and make sure you mention that you heard us on the, on the Jericho show and, and, uh, and we'll go from there and we'll help you, you know, navigate this kind of uncharted waters that we're in. Yeah, and that's what you know. That's what we need. We need somebody that we can trust to help us navigate. Who's going to give us the right information? Who's going to tell us where the best places to put our money? So ultimately, you know, really, if you boil it down, it's all about you know family. If you have one, and and your future. So if you do have a family, this is what you're doing it for. You want to create something that you can pass on to them, something that will give them a springboard into life. You know, when they leave the nest, so to speak, and they start their own life. And if not, you want to set yourself up for the future. You want to come to a point where when you feel like you're done working, you can do that and still live comfortably. So this right. is a great way to do that. So you saw the number there, 877-646-5347. Or if you're feeling techie, noblegoldinvestments.com. Again, Colin, thank you, man, for your time thank and you your so knowledge. Much. And uh, next time you come on, I'm going to ask you if you were King Colin, how would you fix all this? I know it's a big question, so you let that marinate um, until the next time. But make sure you guys call 877-646-5347 or hit it on the web, noblegoldinvestments.com. There are people there who, and, and like you mentioned last time, they invest in precious metals too. They're not just yeah. employees. They're in it too. So they can tell you their fingers on the pulse of what's going on and they can tell you in real time what it's looking like and what's worked for them and maybe what hasn't worked for them. But um, if you're looking for some honest guidance, that's where you need to be. I've, Absolutely. I've, I've brought you to the water horses. It's up to you to take a drink. Colin, thank you very much, man. I appreciate it. Appreciate you carving out some time. And until the next time, people, make sure, one more time, 877-646-5347. Myself and Colin, we are out. Oh, 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 oh,